expressing my gratitude to the organizers. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be here in Banff for the first time. Uh, I'm truly amazed, on the one hand, by the beauty of the context, and on the other, by the quality of the talks we have been listening to. Um, so today, I will report on a, on a long-term project I've been thinking about for a long time. And uh, a project that concerns some global aspects of the theory of, of minimal surfaces. So in some sense, uh, this problem is, is intrinsic to the theory of minimal surface, but I hope it will still inspire some ideas in different directions and maybe even inside uh, uh, mathematical general relativity. So let me start by phrasing the problem in very abstract terms. So here it is. Uh, given a compact Riemannian manifold of dimension at least three, and possibly with no empty boundary, let us consider the class of compact minimal sur hypersurfaces, so co-dimension one theory, possibly with boundary conditions that I'm going to describe later in case the ambient does have a, a non-empty boundary. The goal is to establish what I would call universal comparison theorems relating the most fundamental analytic invariance of an element in this class, which is the Morse index, to the topology of the, the same element, which we would like to encode, say, in the real homology groups of the hypersurface in question, with, say, um, with, say, uh, real, real coefficients. So, uh, to abandon this, this very abstract framework, let me uh, mention uh, a sort of prototypical uh, statement, which was obtained just a few years ago by Savo. So, let's say we take the round sphere with a, in the ambient dimension 3. So, he proved that a non-equatorial minimal surface in here of genus G must have index bounded below by an affine function of the genus, in fact, bounded from below by the genus divided by 2 plus 4. So why is this result so deep and so relevant? So here is the story. So as most of you uh, may know, the proof of the Wilmore conjecture by Marcus and Ness relies on a, on a general uh, inequality which says that in this context, in the, for the round tree sphere, every uh, non-equatorial minimal surface must have index at least five with a quality characterizing Clifford Tori. Okay? So uh, this is great. I mean, this, uh, this turned out to be uh, you know, sort of tailor-made for the, the min-max theory by, by Marcus and Ness. However, what we don't like about this, this uh, index estimate is that it doesn't really bring the topological complexity of M into play. So this is saying that if you have an object of index 1, then the index is greater or equal than 5, but if you have a minimal surface of index 1 trillion, you can only still say that the index is greater or equal than 5. Okay? So somehow what we do like here is that we are really comparing two different measures of complexity. On the right-hand side, we have the topology, which in, uh, for surfaces is just encoded in the genus. On the left-hand side, we have the, the Morse index, which we regard as the, somehow the, the basic analytic invariant of M as a, as a critical point for the area function. So this is somehow the prototype to keep in mind. What we are going to do, what we are going to discuss, is uh, really an embedding of this result which could look a little bit isolated into a general discussion, general theory that covers both closed minimal surfaces and free boundary uh, minimal surfaces. And more specifically, um, the, uh, I will refer to two papers which are both joined with Lucas Ambrosio, former student of Fernando Marquez, and, and Ben Sharp, who was a student of, of Peter Topping. So in the first paper, we deal with a case of a Compact Riemannian manifold without boundary, so the same setting as SAO, if you want. We look at closed minimal hypersurfaces. <coughs> In the second paper, we look at the case with boundary, okay, so if you want Riemannian domains, and we look at free boundary minimal hypersurfaces, okay. 
So somehow the, the, the two theories are really parallel one to the other, but just to, to be definite, to make things simpler, I will just focus on the second, on the second paper, and I will, I will talk about the, uh, the applications that are sort of intrinsic to the theory of free boundary minimal hypersurfaces. So uh, that being said, I will, uh, I will need to recall a few basic facts about uh, free boundary minimal hypersurfaces. Luckily, Sheen has done a great job, so I can go a little bit faster, but um, let, me, let me still remind you of a few basic facts just to uh, sort of set the vocabulary. So let's consider a compact Riemannian domain with non-empty boundary. If you don't like abstraction, just think of the unit ball in R3, and that's already an object which is very interesting and for which our results still have some non-trivial content. So an object inside omega, called dimension one hypersurface, is called free boundary, is called a free boundary minimal hypersurface. If it is a critical point for the area function, uh, when the, the boundary is not really fixed, like say in Plateau's problem, but it's just constrained to move inside the boundary of the ambient. Okay? So this is sort of casual. So that the more formal way of saying this is to look at the space of, um, say, diffeomorphisms that are generated by vector fields that are required to be tangent at the boundary of the ambient. Okay? And if you compute the first variation of the area function in this category, as Shin did about one hour ago, then you will realize that, uh, in, at least for properly embedded hypersurfaces, being a, being a free boundary minimal hypersurface is the same as satisfying these two conditions. The first is that the mean curvature is identically zero, so that's somehow the standard interior condition, but we also have a condition at the boundary, which is indeed the condition that uh, the the surface, the hypersurface in question will meet the boundary orthogonally, or if you want that the conormal vector, which I will denote by nu, uh, is orthogonal to the boundary of the ambient manifold. Okay? Now, once you have a theory, say a nonlinear theory like this one, you may want to look for examples. We have already seen two, but there's, a, there's many more. So the trivial examples have already been mentioned. We can take in the, in the unit 3 ball in R3, we can take flat disks, okay? Or we can take the so-called critical catenoids. So those are just the only catenoids that meet the boundary orthogonally. But there's, a, there's many more examples, and for the purpose of this, talks, I need, uh, of this talk, I need to recall these two classes of examples. So uh, in this respect, let me uh, remark that the topological type of a, of a surface with boundaries is encoded in two integers, which I would call gamma and r. So gamma would just be the genus, while r would be the number of boundary components of uh, the, the surface in question. Okay? So like in this case, we would have, for instance, gamma equal to 1 and r equal to 3. So, in the context of their extensive study of stackle of eigenvalues and its relation to free boundary minimal hypersurfaces, Fraser and Shane proved that there exists a, a, a discrete family of free boundary minimal surfaces in the unit ball in R3 with gamma equal to zero, no handles, and R greater or equal than two, any integer greater or equal than two. Uh, a little bit later, uh, Foglia, Packard, and, and uh, Zoltareva constructed sort of a different family for gamma equal to 1 and R greater or equal than R0. In fact, they also got examples for gamma equal to 0, but I guess it's still not entirely clear whether the examples they got for gamma equal to 0 are in fact the same constructed by Fraser and Schoen. But in any case, we have these two, two families of examples that are parameterized by natural numbers, in fact, by the number of boundary components, that we will have to keep in mind for the sequel of the talk. And, in fact, there, 
you know, I was sort of amazed by the number of existence of results that, that exist inside this theory. So let me just mention a few. So to my knowledge, the, the very first example, the, the very first uh, uh, existence theory for free boundary minimal surfaces due to uh, Courant, 1940, uh, we have then quite many uh, results around late 70s, early 80s. So I should mention uh, Stefan Hildebrand and uh, Johannes Nietzsche, of course, Mix and Yao, as was mentioned before, uh, my colleague uh, Michael Struve, uh, Jürgen Joost, and uh, Joost together with Grüter, and coming to somehow the, the much more recent part of the story, Martin Lee, mean max theory in this category, Maximum Nunes Smith, which is sort of a I would say a uh, more type uh, result in a, for, for free boundary minimal uh, hypersurface, and the list would be, in fact, a, long, a lot longer. So we have, you know, quite a, a huge zoo of elements, and somehow the scope of, of this project is really to put some order in these families, in a sense that I will make precise uh, uh, in, in just a second. In order to to, to get into the statements and to, to clarify our own contributions, let me uh, try to recall the notion of more syndex in this context. So once you have a, a critical point for a functional, you may want to look at the second variation. So to do that, uh, let's assume for simplicity that the free boundary minimal uh, hypersurface in question is two sided, so we can we can determine we can choose a unit normal which I'm gonna call n, okay, and let's say that the this is omega, and at the boundary which is met orthogonally, of course, the picture doesn't have this property by, by Marcus Law, uh, we can pick a conormal, which I'm going to instead call new. Okay? So if we do so, we can sort of reparameterize vector fields that, that are allowed as variations just by means of scalar functions. So let's say that I associate to a vector field uh, capital X a function phi. And I look at the, the corresponding second variation of the area functional associated to phi. Okay, so I can call this v uh, two oh, area m. And if you do this computation, you will find the usual Jacobi operator, which would be this 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 piece here, together with uh, an annoying boundary term, which is the one here on the right. Okay, so this is the integral of, on the boundary of M of the second fundamental form of uh, the boundary of the ambient evaluated at N. Okay? And if you integrate by parts, you will find uh, the usual Jacobi operator. So let me recall that L of phi will be a Schrodinger type operator namely the Laplacian plus the zero for order part, which is A squared plus the normal Ricci times phi, plus a boundary term. And if you stare at this formula for a, a couple of minutes, you will certainly agree with me that uh, if we look at this elliptic eigenvalue problem, we can just define the more index for the problem in question in a natural fashion by looking at the number of negative eigenvalues. So, uh, more precisely, if we look at the, 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 the elliptic problem that I wrote uh, before, by general results, we will have a complete basis of L2 made of eigenfunctions and an associated discrete family of eigenvalues going to plus infinity. And we will call the Morse index just the number of the negative ones. Okay? So, like I said, the general goal is to 
compare this number to the topology of the hypersurface we are studying. Why? Okay, so from my perspective, the problem is really, like I said, to compare different types of information for a, for a say, even in the unit ball, for a class of infinitely many elements that are a priori, you know, could behave very widely. But more concretely, from the constructive viewpoint, I guess it's sort of fair to say that all the methods that we know don't really allow to control the Morse index and the topology at the same time. So oftentimes we can say control the topology, but it, even in, in, in the object that we do construct explicitly, it's often very rare that we can actually compute the Morse index or we can have an effective control. So this poses somehow the need of classification and comparison criteria. Now, to, get, to be a little bit more concrete, let me just uh, refer to a couple of recent results. So, in the context of their extensive analysis, Fraser and Shane proved that if you take a non-flat, like a non-disc, uh, free boundary minimal surface in the unit ball, then the index is greater or equal than 4. But again, as I remarked concerning Urbanus theorem, what we don't really uh, like in this theorem is that it doesn't really bring the topology of M into play. So it doesn't distinguish between something having genus equal to 1 to something having, having genus 100 or 1 trillion. The second problem is, again, that this proof uh, really relies on the symmetry of the unit ball. So we would like to sort of emerge this result to a flexible theory that works for non-symmetric domains or in presence of ambient curvature and, in fact, when both things happen. So a second sort of motivation, which is, of course, related, is provided by uh, a recent result by Cheng, Fraser, and Pang, who proved that if the scalar curvature of the ambient is greater or equal than zero, and if the domain in question is mean convex, then the only free boundary stable minimal surfaces, stable meaning index equal to zero, are either disk or total geodesic annuli. So an obvious question would be, you know, what, can, what are the topological types associated to, say, index equal to one or index equal to two? And in particular, what is the asymptotic theory for index equal to k when k goes to infinity? So what are somehow, how many boxes do I need to insert all the free boundary minimal surfaces when the index is equal to and the, your favorite large number, okay? So I guess we are now ready to state our uh, theorems and let me start with the Euclidean setting. So our analysis is completely general, like you know, any uh, Riemannian domain, essentially no assumption, but just to be concrete, let me start with the Euclidean setting. So uh, let's consider a smooth compact domain of the n plus one dimensional Euclidean space, n greater or equal than two, which means ambient dimension greater or equal than three. And let us consider a compact, orientable, in fact, two-sided, properly embedded free boundary minimal hypersurface. So we have two statements. The first is that if the domain in question is strictly mean convex, then the index of the minimal hypersurface here is bounded from below by a linear function of the first uh, relative of the dimension of the first um, relative homology group of M rel relative to its own boundary. And the second part says that if something a little bit stronger is true, namely if the domain in question, like if the boundary of the domain is in fact strictly too convex, then the same conclusion is true with h n minus 1 in lieu of h1, which in particular means that I can add up the two relations, or if you want, I can take the maximum. Okay? Now, uh, this should be pretty clear, but of course, you know, when, uh, when omega has dimension n plus 1, then d omega will be an n-dimensional smooth surface, so I can describe its extrinsic geometry by a set of numbers called principal curvature lambda 1 up to lambda n. And so 
the assumption that the domain is strictly mean convex is just the assumption that the sign of the lambda i is positive, while the second assumption is that, is that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is greater than 0, assuming that these guys are ordered so that lambda 1 is less or equal than lambda 2, etc. Okay? Okay, so maybe, you know, this could look a little bit abstract, so let me just propose three very concrete corollaries that should convince you of the meaning of this uh, statement. So let's start by talking about the case n equals 2, so our favorite dimension and then dimension 3. So these two statements are the same, and here is the content of our theorem. So let's take a strictly mean convex domain in R3. So a good example is again the unit ball. So given our free boundary minimal surface of genus G, sorry, of genus gamma and R boundary components, then we can say that the index is bounded from below by a function which is affine and linear both in the genus and in the number of boundary components. Okay? And so if you are still not convinced why this is uh, uh, appealing, let me get to corollary number two. So this result here implies that in the Euclidean unit ball there exist free boundary minimal surfaces of arbitrarily large Morse index. So as far as I can tell, prior to our work, despite having a huge zoo of elements of free boundary minimal surfaces in the unit ball, it was not clear that the Morse index had to go to infinity along or could attain arbitrarily large values along these examples. Okay? And of course, this is implied by our, our estimate, and in fact it's implied by the fact that the estimate in question is linear in the number of boundary components. Because remember that examples by President Shane and uh, Packard and co-authors both have bounded, uniformly bounded uh, genus. In one case, genus equal to zero. In the other case, genus equal to one. What makes the difference is the fact that by construction they have a very large number of boundary components. And that was, and that's precisely what implies the fact that the index has to go to infinity. Another corollary that comes almost for free is the following one, which relies on the, on the compactness theory by, again, by Elana Fraser and Martin Lee. So, suppose that we take now a compact domain R3, whose boundary is strictly convex. So, essentially, what, what is implied by our work is that uh, given an integer, say, lambda, if you look at the family of all free boundary minimal surfaces of index bounded by lambda, then that family is strongly compact, meaning compact with respect to smooth, co smooth one-sheeted convergence up to and including the boundary. So now, for those of you who have worked on minimal surfaces, this is certainly quite surprising because, in general, to take the limits of minimal surfaces, you do need index bounds and area bounds. So typically, area bounds need to take, say, a very full limit or a limit in a weak sense. Index bound is what makes the difference at the analytic level in that you realize that you cannot have too many necks, so somehow the, the convergence has to be smooth apart from my finitely many points. Here, the statement a priori is very, very strong because I'm saying that the sole control on the index implies control on any geometric quantity, implies control on the area, implies control on the genus, implies control on the number of boundary components, and so on. And again, you know, this is, this is just you know, a straightforward application of corollary one, given the powerful compactness theory of Fraser and Lee. So this was the Euclidean scenario. Now we can be brave, and I can try to give you the statement of the general theorem, which... Excuse me, so which yeah. part did you show that area bound? Well, it sort of comes for free, right? Because uh, Fraser and Lee yeah. proved that if you have, say, um, a, dom a domain of positive Ricci yeah. and, and, and convex boundary, yeah. then uh, the, the topological type being bounded implies compactness. On the other hand, our inequality here tells you that the sole bound of the index implies bound on both gamma and R, and so you can just appeal to their work. 
Okay, so let me now try to uh, get to Euclidean isometric embeddings. And so here is the sort of the, the moral statement of the general result. So given a Riemannian manifold with boundary, consider an isometric embedding of the manifold in question in some possibly very high dimensional Euclidean space. And let us describe the extrinsic geometry of this embedding by means of the second fundamental form, which I'm going to call 2 with a superscript omega. So if you don't like uh, invoking um, uh, Nash result for manifolds with boundary, let me just observe that, of course, you can just sort of double. So let's say that this is the domain we want to start from. We can just, you know, by standard operations in differential topology, we can essentially double it. And we can then, you know, emerge it isometrically into Rd, possibly by paying a very large price in terms of D. And we can describe the, the associated geometry by means of a second fundamental form, which I'm, I'm going to denote this way. So the moral statement of our general result is, is roughly the following, that if the curvature of this manifold is positive enough in an L2 sense compared to the size of the second fundamental form of the isometric embedding, then, and if you pick a domain which is respectively mean convex or, 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 uh, or two convex, then the conclusion of, say, part one or respectively part two is true. Okay, now, of course, a priori, this poses the problem of an optimal isometric embedding. In general, those embeddings will not be unique, so somehow the, co the, the condition here could be true for some embeddings or false for some others. Now, let me try to uh, give you the precise statement. Okay, so let's fix now an ambient Riemannian manifold, and let's fix inside it a free boundary minimal hypersurface. Now, suppose that the intrinsic curvature dominates the extrinsic curvature, meaning that this function inequality here is true. Now, you may be puzzled by the fact that this looks extremely hard to, to verify, but I will show you in a second that, in fact, it's, it's true in most cases one can possibly think of. Well, suppose this is true, then whenever you take a strictly mean convex uh, domain, which was case one of the Euclidean statement, then essentially the same conclusion is true, provided you just replace 2 divided by n times n plus 1 by 2 divided by d times d minus 1. And again, you have the first relative homology group. And again, we have the second part. So if the domain in question is strictly to convex, then we can take either H1 or Hn minus 1 or the maximum or any linear combination. Now, notice that a priori, this condition here does depend on n. Right? So I'm comparing two integrals that depend on n. However, in practice, what, what happens in, in the list of applications that I'm going to show you in a second is that one can actually check this condition here at a pointwise level. So given a concrete Riemannian manifold, say a sphere or a product of spheres, what one can do is just you know, compute the Riemann tensor and the Ricci tensor explicitly and compare the, them to an explicit isometric embedding into the Euclidean space, check this condition at a pointwise level, which, of course, will imply that the condition in question is true for any m. And so the conclusion itself will be true for any m. So this is what I, I mean by universal comparison theory. So... Can I just ask quickly? Yeah, sure. You may have said this already, but I missed it. What is d again? So d is the, is the dimension of the isometric embed, the, <coughs> the ambient. So, of course, a priori, you know, the, the conclusion could be true for several d's. In particular, you may want to take the, the minimum d for which this is true. So, okay, so again, you know, you may wonder whether this condition is never satisfied, and I claim it's not the case. So, in particular, uh, 
the condition in question, and, and so the conclusion in question is true for mean convex or respectively two convex domains in, in all rank one symmetric spaces. That is to say, spheres, uh, all projective spaces over R, over, over C, over the coternions and the tailing plane. Okay? And for reasons that I will not really uh, be able to get into, like the case of CP2 is, is in fact very delicate. So um, CP2 presents some problems that make uh, checking this, this condition here quite delicate. Uh, we can then get, for instance, product of spheres at least when the dimensions that are involved are not the couple 2, comma 2, and again, this would be sort of a long story. And we then have a set of other, other examples, the, the most remarkable ones being um, suitably pinched three manifolds. So we, we can present a, you know, an explicit condition on the scalar curvature of a three manifold that ensures that the condition, uh, the, the condition in, in question is true. Okay. So um, now let me let me uh, give some ideas of the proof. Of course, I will not even try to get into the details. But I think that at a very le vague level, uh, there are three uh, ingredients <coughs> behind the proof. There is some topology, and that will concern relating uh, the homology group to harmonic forms with certain boundary conditions. <coughs> there is some analysis which will be about relating uh, the harmonic, an harmonic one form with certain boundary condition to the value of the Jacobi form on its component on some Euclidean frame. And then there is some algebra which is needed to conclude. So let me try to say <coughs> something for each of the three components. So let's start with topology. Of course, our statements involve, uh, involve relative homology groups, right? So they involve something like HK, MN, DMN, R. So given that we, we do differential topology, differential geometry, we want to relate this object, which a priori is algebraic, to something we, we can handle. And that's, of course, um, related to some version of Hodge theory for manifolds with boundary. So if we were in the classical setting, we know that each uh, real cohomology class can be represented by unique, an essentially unique harmonic form. So here we have something similar. So for a fixed M, let's consider D the differential and D star the co-differential. So we can introduce uh, two subspaces of harmonic forms. Harmonic being meaning in this setting co closed and co-closed. So the first one is denoted by a subscript n, and the condition that I'm requiring is a boundary condition that concerns the vanishing of the normal component of the form in question. So an harmonic form will belong here if and only if the interior product of the form in question with the unique conormal nu is equal to zero. The second space I will introduce is denoted by a subscript T, and it's made of those harmonic forms for which the tangential component is zero, which I will uh, encode by requiring that the exterior product of nu with omega, or if you want omega sharp, is equal to zero along the boundary. Now, uh, Hodge theory, so as a general fact, we do know that we have an isomorphism between the space of Neumann harmonic forms of order P and the P uh, cohomology group of M. So in particular, if we combine this with uh, standard poincare lefschetz duality, we can sort of canonically identify these analytic spaces here, the space of uh, P harmonic form with tangential, uh, um, with um, vanishing tangential component is uh, isomorphic to HP, so the P homology, uh, relative homology group, and uh, correspondingly, the, uh, 
the space of harmonic n minus p forms with uh, vanishing normal components will be isomorphic to HP. So in particular, notice that for p equals 1, I get an isomorphism between this guy here and the relative, uh, the, the relative homology group of order 1, and for p equals uh, for, for p equals 1 here, sorry, for p equals n minus 1, I will get an isomorphism between h1n and hn minus 1m with respect to dn. So this is the link between the topological objects, the topological groups that appear in the statement, and these analytic objects. Once we, we, we have reduced our uh, work to harmonic forms, then we need to, we can start doing computations. And here is the crucial point where the Euclidean embedding comes into play. So what we need to, explo to exploit in, um, in, in the assumption of the existence of a, a Euclidean isometric embedding is the fact that we do have a global frame. So as soon as we have this RD, we have a frame theta1 theta d, which is global and parallel with respect to the ambient connection. And in particular, we can consider a family of functions that are, are parametrized by two integers, uij, that are nothing but a projection of the, the, the form n wedge omega sharp to the induced uh, ambient uh, basis for the space of two forms, which is nothing but theta i wedge theta j for i less than j. So if we do so, we get a family of functions, and the key claim is that uh, even though we don't have a very good control on q uij, comma uij, when we sum up for i less than j, we do get something that can be related in a direct fashion to the size of the harmonic form we start with. So there is sort of a, an averaging principle that, that makes things work. So again, let me state uh, the identity in question in a very special case, so Euclidean domains uh, flat metric. So here is the, the, the prototypical statement. So let's take uh, compact domain, usual notation for mean, for mean curvature and second fundamental form. Let's fix a free boundary minimal hypersurface. So, whenever we take uh, a form which is normal at the boundary, that is to say, in the previous notation, whenever we take an element in here, we have a general identity that relates essentially the integral on the right hand side here with the average value of the Jacobi form associated to the components uij that have been constructed using the global frame. And similarly, if I take an element omega, which is instead tangential at the boundary, then I get a similar identity that brings into play these two guys here. And so you see sort of immediately that if you assume the domain in question to be mean convex, that will say that the sum in question is negative. And if you assume that the domain is too convex, then the sum with this sum here will be negative. So I've told you about the topology. I've told you about the sort of computation that become, of course, super hard when you want to deal with the general scenario of a remaining domain uh, embedding to RD because you, you may have to pay a huge co-dimension. Now let me tell you how to conclude the argument given these two identities. So the argument is uh, sort of a, some basic linear algebra, but I find it sort of uh, very interesting. So let me let me discuss it. So remember. So let's stick to the Euclidean scenario, and uh, uh, let's let's stick to part one. So let's say we want to prove that index of a free boundary minimal hypersurface is bounded from below 
by 2 divided by n, n plus 1, the dimension of each one n relative to the boundary. Okay, so let's say that this is our goal. Okay? So, we know that this, this group here is canonically isomorphic to H1T. Okay, we have already seen that. So we consider a linear map. The map goes from H1T to some Euclidean space of dimension n choose 2 times k. What is this map? So let's say that the, 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 the free boundary surface in hypersurface in question has index equal to k. So let me denote by phi 1 up to phi k the negative eigenfunctions, okay? So in particular, in my notation, lambda k plus 1 will be greater or equal than 0. So I consider the map that associates to a form in H1T a huge matrix of numbers, which is the one that I wrote there, namely, I consider all the numbers that are integral over M of uij times phi uh, q, where i and j are between 1 and uh, d, and q is between 1 and k. So I cook up this matrix, and of course, linear algebra tells us that the dimension of the space on the left hand side will be less or equal, in fact, uh, well, will be equal to the dimension of the kernel plus the dimension of the image. So that, in particular, will be less or equal than the dimension of the kernel plus n choose 2 times k. Now remember, uh, so in particular, if I can prove that this map is injective, that is to say the kernel is equal to 0, then I win. Okay? So if this is the case, then k has to be greater or equal than, than 1 over n choose 2 times the dimension of this uh, of this space here, which is equal to the dimension of the, rel uh, the, the first relative homology group. So why is this map injective? So here I use just the, the usual uh, variational characterization of eigenvalues. So let's pick an element in the kernel of the map phi. So being in the kernel means that all of these integrals here are equal to zero, right? So in other words, this is saying that each uij is orthogonal in L2 sense to each phi q. So if we go back to our first course in uh, calculus of variations, then we realize that we can use each uij as a test function for computing, L, uh, for computing lambda k plus 1. So, in other words, lambda k plus 1, by construction, lambda k plus 1 will be less or equal than q uij, uij renormalized by dividing by the L2 size of uij. Okay? And this is true for each i and j, in particular it's true when I add up. So, on the one hand, I have that given that lambda k plus 1 is greater or equal than 0 by construction, I know that this sum is greater or equal than 0. But on the other hand, I can appeal to the first identity. The first identity is saying that we do understand this average. This average is equal to minus the integral over the boundary of the mean curvature of the ambient times omega squared. And so if the boundary is uh, mean convex, which is what I was assuming for, the part, for this part of the statement, then uh, this, the right hand side here is less than zero, and so I get a contradiction unless omega is, is equal to zero. So it's the trivial harmonic form. So what is the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is of course that there is no kernel, and so the dimension of H1t is less or equal than n choose 2 times k, which is nothing but the, the index estimate that we, we wanted to prove. Sorry, what was the um, ident identity above you were referring to? This one here. So the, the way I would phrase it is the following. 
you take a free boundary minimal surface, but something, something similar is true in the closed case. You take an harmonic form on that free boundary minimal surface, possibly with suitable boundary condition. So you can look at components of that one form, or in fact, of n wedge omega onto an ambient frame. And so we don't quite understand each of these components. We don't quite understand the action of the Jacobi form on each component, but we do understand them on average. That is to say, when we add up all the components, we get this neat identity. Now, this identity being given, you can transform a geometric assumption, namely, say, the assumption that the domain is mean convex, into an assumption about uh, a negative direction for the Jacobi form. And this is what makes the, the algebraic argument work. Now, of course, if, if you try to prove the general case, the, namely, if you want to get to this theorem here, the, the topological part would be almost the same. So we have these spaces of forms, and we can identify them by means of Hodge theory to relative homology groups over R. This part will also be the same. The identities will need a lot more work, so we will have to prove, you know, Bochner identities, combine them with Gauss and Kodath equations, and work quite a lot to get all of those extrinsic and intrinsic curvature terms. But once sort of the general identities are proven, then also the, of course, the algebraic part of the argument is, uh, is in fact very, very similar. So uh, to, to, to sum up, uh, we started with uh, Savo's uh, inequality that can be regarded as an improvement of Rubano. And we, we try to really uh, embed it into a general treatment and to try to compare different notions of complexity for minimal hypersurface. OK, I'll stop here. Thank you. So our condition is stronger than, than positive Ricci. Yes. So in general, so like in the closed case, which is somehow the paper I didn't say anything about, I, it is conjectured that in ambient dimension 3, Ricci positive should imply that the index, the Morse index is always bounded from below by a linear function of the first petty number. Now, we, we did settle this, this result under more restrictive assumptions. Such assumptions are satisfied in a number of interesting cases, but they are not quite equivalent to rich post. So as you phrased it, the, the problem, I mean, the statement is expected to be true, but it's still an open problem. Any other questions? Yeah, so in this, it, this, this is the description in RN, you said? Right. Or R plus 1? Right. So what is the analog of theta i, which theta j in general? Well, I mean, the, the problem is that we, we take an ambient approach, right? So, oh, that's right. Okay. So like, you know, if you, if you have a remanent domain, then you may have to pay a huge d. Okay. But once you pay this d, then you have these guys. So you have a global uh, basis for two forms. And those are the elements that you use to construct the, fun the test functions uijs. So really, in the general case, what, what becomes painful is to get replacements for these identities. Because when you start taking uh, sort of the, the derivative of the energy of, I mean, if you look at the sort of the Dirichlet uh, energy of the uijs, then you will have to differentiate omega, and you, you will have to differentiate the normal. Now, covariant derivatives of the normal will have components on the tangent to omega and components that are orthogonal to omega. So that's why you will have somehow uh, sort of intrinsic terms, intrinsic to omega, and extrinsic terms that bring the uh, isometric embedding into play. Anything else? Other questions? Thanks again. <laughs>